are we ready please go ahead sir yeah uh, good evening everybody a warm welcome to learn from the legends the international neonatology webinar series since 2020 organized by national neonatology forum kerala iap neochap nnf trishur and iap trishur today we are fortunate to have a legend professor valdemar carlo from university of alabama at birmingham usa this topic would be surfactant positive airway pressure and pulse oximetry trial the lessons learned by professor valdemar carlo to moderate this session we have two eminent neonatologists from india dr tejo pradab oleti from hyderabad he is head of the department of neonatology from fernandez hospital hyderabad we also have dr pinaki chakrabarti sncu in charge silicher medical college from assam a warm welcome to both of you and of course to the legend now over to dr vc manoj to introduce the eminent speaker and take the session forward thank you very much thank you sir hello everyone good morning good afternoon and good evening depending on which part of the globe you are in hearty welcome and warm greetings to a third year of our learn from the legends international neonatology webinar series thank you so much for joining us today as well continuing with our lecture in this series today we'll discuss regarding the fallacies and updates in targeting oxygen saturation levels what have we learned so far from the various trials support boost to cot trial and neoprom the meta analysis that followed to deliver today's lecture i have great pleasure to invite a true legend of neonatal research professor valdemar carlo known to his colleagues as valley professor valley is a professor of pediatrics and the director division of neonatology at the university of alabama at birmingham alabama professor valley has extensive experience in collaborative large scale clinical research including the design implementation data analysis and reporting of neonatal and childhood research performed in the us and in the developing countries we were just having a small chat just now and then he was mentioning how he is traveling and then he had been to india as well uh, as a part of the his passion for neonatal research in various parts the global neonatology concept he has undertaken projects across a wide variety of topics including neonatal mortality neurodevelopmental growth outcomes infectious disease and neonatal resuscitation friends it is amazing to speak of some of the ongoing re and recently completed projects he has it's a big list let me just sort out a few poppy trial providing an optimized and empowered pregnancy for you trial repurposing and endopartum and azithromycin as a neuroprotector in birth asphyxia very interesting heart rate detection during resuscitation to reduce early neonatal mortality and interventions to reduce infant mortality and morbidity in low resource settings probably the need of the hour in global neonatology his citations are too many and i will not attempt to read out all of them professor valley has led single central trials and major multi central trials such as the first breath trial the brain heat trial and the support trial of which he will speak to us today ladies and gentlemen let's hear from the true legend of neonatal research 
today professor valdemar carlo over to you sir thank you very much man you know uh, thanks for the privilege of uh, sharing ideas and uh, talking with such a broad audience uh, I, I when you heard said so many time songs i'm really impressed and like that the support trials were also done in so many time zones so it's very pertinent for uh, this audience so i'll share this my screen Uh, can you see now in the presentation mode? Yes, sir. It is visible. Perfect. Please go ahead. Perfect. So we'll talk about the lessons uh, from the support and other oxygen saturation trials. Uh, so we have a unique situation in which a support trial uh, was designed first and all the other four trials were designed to be almost identical as much as possible. So this is a unique opportunity to look at the results of these trials. Uh, I work at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Uh, compared to so many Indian cities, it's a relatively small city uh, of uh, about a million people, but we have a very large academic institution and we do a lot of research. I will focus, this is my disclosure slide. I will focus on human data. I don't study rats, I, I eat them, that's a joke. But, uh, but uh, just to emphasize that the data that will be presented are from human studies, nothing about animal research. Uh, and we will review the state of the science on oxygen saturation targeting before these recent trials. We will then review the evidence of the trials, including the individual participant meta-analysis. And I'll just highlight that this individual participant meta-analysis is the study in medicine of the highest level of evidence. I will get to why that is the case. This is different to a meta-analysis. This is different to just an individual participant meta-analysis because it says meta-analysis of uh, synchronized studies. Uh, they were uh, harmonized before they were conducted. Uh, and finally, understand how to translate the findings of these oxygen saturation trials there has been a lot of controversy in interpreting the results. So I will bring you an interpretation that is based really on the experts from the trials. All the trial leaders uh, met and worked on interpreting the results. So I bring you the consensus of that interpretation. First, let's review the evidence of the science before the support trial was initiated. We know oxygen is important. Uh, people think they cannot live without love, but really we cannot live without oxygen. But how much oxygen do we give a baby so he lives and he doesn't have adverse effects? That is the question. So there has been no consensus on oxygen saturation trials. The American Academy of Pediatrics published that they recommended 85 to 95% uh, saturation levels, but this was really pragmatically determined. This was not evidence-based and there was no standards for assessing the need of oxygen. How much oxygen does a baby really need? So this was the question that had to be answered. So that uh, before the oxygen saturation trial suggested that oxygen toxicity in preterm infants may increase the risk of ROP. That's the original trials on ROP revised, uh, reviewed by Dr. Askey and published in 2009, showing that oxygen exposure increased retinopathy of prematurity. 
Uh, also, the, the randomized trial of Dr. Askey and the stop rope trial show that targeting high saturations, like high 90s, increase the incidence of BPD, including oxygen at home. Finally, cerebral palsy, le lower level of evidence, that's actually a, a, an observational study, but uh, Dr. Collins showed that cerebral palsy was associated with the use of additional oxygen. And finally, the meta-analysis uh, by Tan and others uh, showing that death is increased uh, in resuscitation trials. And some of these studies you, you are aware because they were done in India and it sh they show increased risk of death when exposure to oxygen was routine at birth. And this is the meta-analysis from the TAN study. You see the studies by Ramji uh, and Sostak and Vento uh, showing that uh, room air resuscitation compared to oxygen uh, decreases mortality. So you can see here a large effect size. And therefore now the practice of resuscitation at birth is usually started with room air uh, in term babies. I like to point to the heterogeneity uh, measure here, uh, the next to the last line here showing the I square of zero, saying that there's no heterogeneity in these trials. And we'll see the same thing for the oxygen saturation trials. Little known, but the studies by ASCII and STOPROP show a trend for increased mortality was not statistically significant, but the liberal use of oxygen of more than 95 to 96%, targeting that in premature babies tended to increase mortality. The numbers are small, not statistically significant, but the trend is interesting. So before support, uh, the CUT and the BOOST2 trials, there had not been randomized controlled trials of oxygen saturation targets below 90%. But there was some evidence from randomized controlled trials that indicated that high oxygen saturations led to adverse outcomes. So this is what I have shown, this evidence from randomized trials that high saturations may be bad. So higher than 95, 96, that was probably, uh, ad, that led to adverse outcomes, including mortality. Furthermore, observational studies suggested that lower sat sat oxygen saturation targeting may reduce death, ROP, and BPD. And here are the data. This is the, maybe one of the best studies of its type. It's over 500 patients, multiple institutions, and uh, they compare in a retrospective analysis outcomes by oxygen saturation targets in different neonatal ICUs. So some neonatal ICUs had saturation targets of 70 to 90, 84 to 94, sorry, uh, 95, 85, 95, and 88, 98, as you can see here. And uh, as you can see in the red symbols, retinopathy of prematurity uh, was substantially lower at the lowest saturation targets, including 70 to 90 percent. That was the lowest ROP. And mortality and cerebral palsy did not differ. Let's look at the actual numbers so you can see a bit more of the magnitude of the effects here. And these are the same data just reported, 568 babies uh, between 23 and 27 weeks. And you can see that the unit that had oxygen saturation uh, alarm limits and targets, 70 to 90%, had a substantially lower rate of uh, 
retinopathy of prematurity in the last column, but also had substantially less days on the ventilator, as you can see, a, a third of the time on the ventilator. Other studies, uh, the study by Dr. Cho, uh, this is a pre-post study, show that when saturation targets were reduced to not more than 93%, typically 85 to 93, uh, they had uh, the period of lower saturation targeting had also lower mortality, as you can see here. And this lower mortality was occurred at all birth weight subgroups, as you can see here, especially in the smallest babies, as you can see here, with a substantial reduction of mortality. I should say these were retrospective studies uh, uh, or a pre-post really. The, 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 the intervention was done prospectively, but the data were collected pre-post. So therefore, data before the recent oxygen saturation trial suggested that lower oxygen saturations, uh, uh, like less than 90, would improve outcomes safely. So the first question, uh, Manoj, do you have it there? Yes, I am going to launch it. Do I have to stop sharing? Yeah. So the question is, what are the preferred oxygen saturation trial uh, targets for extremely preterm infants? Sorry, what are your preferred? What do you prefer? Single choice, 85, 89, 88, 92, 91, 95, 85, 95. And you can vote now. Okay, so this is a, a wide range of responses uh, from a narrow, small, uh, low range to a narrow mid range, a narrow uh, high range and a broad range. So this is excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this is a, a this has had been an unresolved. A oxygen issue. Uh, uh, there were many anti-trialists, like uh, Dr. Silver mentioned here. Uh, but the issue was that there, even though there was evidence that we did not know what saturation targets to use, uh, there was a little uh, effort to to do randomized trials. So he wrote that he was encouraged to learn that these disturbing findings, the lack of oxygen oxy saturation data, uh, led to international randomized control trials. So this was a big deal because uh, neonatology had lacked research in this area. So let's go to the support trial and I will highlight the results of the support, but imagine all the other trials being very similar, having very similar results. I will highlight the type of population and the results of, of this trial. So all the trials had small babies. So this is the support trial. Babies were around 800 grams and 26 weekers. And all the trials had the same type of population. Uh, the this, this support trial showed that there were, while there was no difference in the primary outcome of severe ROP or death, as you can see here, there was a significant reduction in uh, severe ROP, about a 50% reduction in ROP. So a large effect actually in reduction of 
retinopathy of severe retinopathy of prematurity. In contrast, there was an increased mortality in the low oxygen saturation trial. This was unexpected, as you can see from the observations uh, from the uh, prior data. I should say that all the studies, all the five trials, show very similar uh, results in terms of ROP and death. And I will highlight the lack of heterogeneity in the results. In addition, uh, we look at all the pulmonary outcomes. And here are uh, detailed results of the respiratory outcomes and BPD, the use of oxygen at 36 weeks differed. This was in large part because of a difference in death and because this measure does not include the physiologic test. When you correct on the third row, BPD, physiologic definition or death, you see no difference in BPD or death. Similarly, pneumothorax, air leaks, postnatal steroids, they did not differ. PDA, PDA did not differ. It, this was a concern that targeting low saturations would open the ductus. That was not the case. You can see here, there was no difference in the incidence of PDA, which happened in about half of the patients, or medical treatment, which happened in about a third of the patients, or surgical treatment, which happened in about a tenth of the patients. Intracranial hemorrhage, uh, 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 PVL neck, or latum sepsis, they did not differ significantly. Notice here that next stage two or greater did not differ significantly. There was a difference of an absolute difference of 1.1. Uh, I will show that the meta-analysis showed that neck was overall was increased when the meta-analysis is done. So that's an important difference between support and the other trials, but the data in support are consistent with it. There's no heterogeneity really because it goes in the same direction. And finally, the neurodevelopmental outcomes. Patients were followed to 18 month to 22 month corrected age. And you can see here the difference in death persisted. So there was no difference in death after discharge or after hospitalization uh, or after uh, 36 weeks. So you can see here that the effect persisted. Notice also bilateral blindness, 1% in both groups, no difference. So there was a difference, well, there was a difference in ROP, there was not a difference in blindness. And we also analyze other measures of eye function or, uh, or ophthalmologic findings. You see other eight measures here, none of which uh, differ between the groups either. So not only was the blindness not different between the groups, furthermore, there were no other ophthalmologic findings to be concerned about. So let's talk about the meta-analysis and I will just mention briefly the traditional meta-analysis. This was published in 2017, the Cochrane meta-analysis. And this is just a traditional meta-analysis and it shows uh, the neck uh, findings. You see here, necrotizing enterocolitis, uh, the difference of uh, 2% with the number needed to treat of uh, 50. Uh, and all the other findings are consistent with what we've talked about. Uh, uh, up to now. Uh, the difference uh, in the Neoprom is that this was a prospectively planned meta-analysis. So uh, it is important that the trials were harmonized. So the trials were harmonized largely because the investigators met for many years and planned a study. And uh, once the support trial was funded by the NIH, that design, exact design, was used for the other applications. And all the trials show 
uh, use the same methods. Uh, so what the trials, uh, the five trials were conducted between 2005 and 2014, uh, and uh, they all enrolled infants below 28 weeks. So they were uh, uh, very uh, 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 harmonized design and conduct of the trial. We use the same algorithm for saturation targeting. So we use the same uh, monitors. Every center uses the same methods. So as agreed, the primary outcome was a composite of death or major disability. Uh, this, just, this is just a measure that we all agreed would be the most important finding from the meta-analysis because we needed the sample size to be able to determine long-term outcomes. So the sample size was almost 5,000 patients and that was achieved. And this is the primary analysis of the study. It's a protocol defined outcome. So we use death or disability or major disability as defined by each of the individual studies. And what you can see here is that uh, there is no difference in death or disability as shown by the initial meta-analysis, uh, this is consistent with the Cochrane study because it's similar data in the sense that it's not subgroup analysis and it's not further definitions. It's the same definition as used by the protocol itself. And you can see overall, there's no difference. And the I square at the bottom, is 0.14, so it's a minimal heterogeneity. This doesn't mean that every single study has to show even the same direction. Notice that the BOOST 2 in New Zealand, the smallest study, went in the opposite direction, but really none of the studies show any significant difference. Now, now we do uh, the meta-analysis. This meta-analysis allows us to look further into obtaining supportive analysis of the primary outcome. So this is, the again, the primary outcome, but now with supportive analysis, including more patients. And you can see here that there's also no difference in the outcome of death or disability. How about the components? of the primary outcome. And this is maybe the most important slide of the presentation. When, you, when one looks at the death uh, by corrected age of 18 to 24, you, <coughs> you can see here a 3% three, <coughs> three difference in mortality that is highly significant with the lower saturation targets of 85, 89, having an increased mortality from 17 to 20%, so 3% absolute increase, highly statistically significant. And in contrast, you see that there's no difference in the other components of the primary outcome, meaning disability whether you take primary major disability, supportive major disability, just the Bailey, just the Rampolsi, deafness or visual impairment, there's no difference. So to make sure we get a clear message, uh, the studies show that death was increased in the infants that had targets of 85, 89. And this is targets. I will uh, later address what saturations were achieved. Looking at other outcomes, this is also a very important slide. So you can see that death at 36 weeks was different. Uh, again, a 3% difference in death. 
Death before hospital discharge, 3% difference again, suggesting that the difference in mortality is mostly while in the hospital. Uh, you can see here that there was no difference in medical or surgical treatment for a PDA, but surgical treatment was slightly increased by 1% statistically significant. Okay. Not once we start looking at so many analyses, it's possible that some are really associations. And in fact, in the, this study in JAMA, we emphasize the importance of considering these as associations. Uh, treatment for retinopathy uh, was a decrease in the infants with lower oxygen saturation targets uh, and supplemental oxygen at 36 weeks was less used in contrast, se uh, severe necrotizing enterocolitis was uh, higher in the low saturation group by 2%. Uh, there have been many subgroup analysis just to highlight that the revised algorithm for the software, and you can see here uh, the difference in the patient populations, but this is what actually was mostly associated with increasing mortality. So it's a new software. It's a software that the monitors have. The real software had some faulty results. So the revised software is the one that is current and is the one that showed the biggest difference in terms of mortality. But I should say, for example, that uh, studies that did only use only original software had also the same direction of the effect of mortality. Uh, there were other subgroups, for example, if a study was started less than six hours at, uh, in the more premature babies or less premature babies, uh, the birth location in Boragal board or at steroids, and there was no difference. Other subgroups by gender, small for gestational age, uh, a multiple birth and time of delivery were not statistically significant. I like to highlight that uh, the SGA, because there was a manuscript on this that subsequently was found not to be correct. Uh, and this will be presented soon. Uh, so this is the data on mortality, on age of mortality. And you can see that it takes at least two weeks to see a separation in mortality. I like to highlight this because it's not that we're going to expose a baby to a low saturation, 85 to 89, and he will die soon. No, there will not be immediate consequences of it. This evidence shows that it's only long-term consequences. While we have tried to look at why, we don't know yet, but it could be that the lungs are primed with low saturations to have adverse outcomes later, such as pulmonary hypertension, but we don't know that yet. So uh, this is the evidence of uh, death by, uh, by 18 to 24 months in the less than 26 weekers. And you can see here that in this subgroup, uh, death also was higher in the low saturation group and these infants uh, may be at the biggest uh, difference in death. Uh, you can see here a 5% difference in death. Uh, one subgroup that has been studied is the SGA babies. And while support reported that the mortality differed in the SGA infants the most, you can see here from 29 to 58%, uh, other trials did not show that SGA was important in the determining death. Now, when we use a standard definition across the board for all the sites, including the support trial, and standard definition for SGA, one can see no difference in mortality. Thus, the mortality risk by SGA was not present. It was all babies that had the difference in mortality. 
neck was not, the difference in neck was not found in support, but was found in the other trials as shown here. And in fact, if you could look at individual trials, none of them show statistically significant finding with neck, but you can see including support had a large, the largest relative risk, adjusted relative risk. When you put together all these results, then the difference was statistically significant by oh, almost 3%, as you can see here. And neck in the bigger babies by above 26 weeks also differ by about 2%. So you can see uh, how important it is to do this individual participant meta-analysis. It's helping understand the outcome so much better. A again, I, have, I should highlight that none of the individual studies show a difference in neck in this, in this uh, in the 26 weeks and above. Severe visual impairment uh, was also analyzed. And you can see here from all the trials, there was no difference in severe visual impairment. So then we have the second question now. Which of the following are potential adverse effects of oxygen saturation targets? Do we have the results Not yet? Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Great. Yes. Death, ROP, and neck. Yes, these are the most important adverse effects of oxygen saturation targeting. They go in different directions, obviously. Uh, neck and death are increased with low saturation targets, ROP with high. But remember, I. I did not put here blindness because blindness did not differ. So very good. Thank you. Yes. So uh, how, how do we interpret these findings? Uh, these findings are a little bit dif dif difficult to understand. Some of the experts had said, well, too many babies develop ROP. So I'm concerned about severe ROP. Uh, other experts would say, well, mortality is more important. It's long-term. So obviously there was difficulty in interpreting the results. Uh, so this is a review of some of the uh, comments that have been mentioned. Uh, this is uh, right after the last study was published. There were comments and recommendations. Uh, while uh, Manja said the evidence was low or moderate in two different reviews, ASCII, which did an independent analysis, uh, concluded that the quality of the evidence was high. And most experts this day consider that the evidence was uh, high. Uh, notice here, I put this recommended saturation targets, and this is the first five years uh, after some of the trials were published. And you can see here that most experts recommend the saturations on the higher side, as you can see here. Only the last two references here 
recommended the range of 85, 95. Uh, and now I'll switch to the next five years so you can see how consensus has evolved now. Now, the most recent years, no one recommends saturations below 90% as shown here. Uh, and uh, the recommendation is usually 91, 95, but that comes from the trial. And I think it's reasonable to, if people want to say 90, 95, I think that's reasonable. What I will address is actually achieve saturations and that's a different story, but I will discuss that soon. In terms of the quality of evidence, uh, I think, uh, especially for selected outcomes like death or disability, the, the, uh, the, the evidence, part of the evidence is very high. It, both death and disability were assessed very, very carefully. Uh, other, uh, uh, out, uh, other outcomes, for example, hearing loss and blindness, this is just limited data. Just in not enough data to have a high quality of evidence. But in general, most experts now consider a, a pretty high quality of evidence. Now I will address the issue of actual uh, saturations achieved versus targets of oxygen saturation. This is an extremely important, uh, this is important data as we try to implement these practices. So the main issue is how did the actual oxygen saturations achieved compared to the oxygen saturation uh, targets in the five trials? So it's important that the investigators collected data on saturations achieved and not just saturation targets. This was a huge undertaking as you can imagine with collecting data for all the duration of oxygen exposure in these infants. And data were collected from all the sites. Uh, uh, so the main results that I will show is that in the high oxygen saturation target group, infants achieved saturations that approximated this high target oxygen saturation. So, so in the high oxygen saturation group, results are consistent with the target. However, in the low oxygen saturation target group, infants achieve oxygen saturations that were substantially higher than the target of saturations. In fact, they were like intermediate. We'll show this in this slide. This slide shows all the data from all the trials. Uh, the first one is a support trial. And you can see here, uh, in the dark line are the saturation achieved in the high oxygen saturation trial in our arm, I mean. You can see the red columns are the targets of 91, 95. And you can see how that curve uh, uh, of data in the black line coincides with the targets. In contrast, in the cut line here, in the red, you can see how the low saturation target group had achieved saturations that actually peaked at 91% and were intermediate. They were actually not in the low saturation targets, really, as you can see here. So therefore, even the smaller difference in saturations it led to this difference in mortality. You can see the next slide is the CUT trial, which also shows almost identical results with the targets in the high saturation group approximating, sorry, the actual saturations in the high saturation target group approximating those targets and the targets, the low oxygen saturation target group having much higher saturations than the target of 85, 89. 
the uh, boost trials on the right actually had a bit of better uh, separation. And you can see that, again, the high saturation target group achieved the high saturations. Again, the low saturation target group had higher saturations than achieved, than, uh, had higher achieved saturations than target. So does the increased mortality and increased neck in the low saturation target group occur despite achieved saturation targets that were higher than the low saturation targets? Furthermore, achieve the chief satur oxygen saturations in the low oxygen saturation group mimic previous recommendations of 85, 89. So try to summarize this. Saturations for 85, 89 are not recommended uh, based on these trials. Uh, 91, 95 is. And be careful because intermediate saturations between 88 and 92 or so is close to what was achieved in the low saturation target groups in the three trials. So one has to be careful and not extrapolate and say something intermediate just because the uh, outcomes of ROP went in the opposite direction. So I'm trying to conclude, the, the studies were well designed, allocation concealment was achieved, masking of the intervention and assessment was achieved. This was remarkable because uh, with imagine 5,000 patients and each one being managed by a nurse for many, many days and not knowing what saturations really the baby has, but knowing that uh, he's in the trial. And the most important outcomes were assessed and they were assessed very well. The results were not heterogeneous. The low I square statistics uh, indicate this. And the mortality effect persisted after two years. It, the difference in mortality was in the hospital, but it persisted. So there were no long term adverse effects of the high saturation target in terms of mortality. Uh, after discharge, which is very important. So I just mentioned this slide briefly uh, because we don't want to do what happened with the antinatal steroids. Uh, this is a study of ligands. It was a large study. It showed benefits. And subsequently, there were other studies that were beneficial, but there were other studies that were very influential because they were uh, a negative, like the US study. Uh, but if you look at the cumulative meta analysis throughout the whole period, you can see that even when negative studies were added, there was a statistically a significant difference and improvement in outcomes in neonatal death based on the uh, cumulative meta analysis. And this is what would happen now if we add more studies. The effect of mortality is large for the saturation trials. So there's really no purpose in doing further observation, further randomized control trials if they're designed the same way. I should mention that we don't have data for older infants. We don't know, for example, what saturation targets term infants should have. That's another question. So, how do we translate this into practice? Uh, so what is the current practice for oxygen saturation targeting for infants less than 28 weeks? As I mentioned, uh, most recommendations now, now address, now, now uh, prefer 9195, but there was a survey conducted in 2015 and another one in 2016 in more than 500 NICUs. And while they show wide variation in practice, uh, they also show that uh, they had increased their median oxygen saturation targets by two to 5%. And the most up-to-date guidance for practice published since Neoprom uh, recommends 
oxygen saturation targets of 91-95%. So uh, targeting oxygen saturation of 91-95 will reduce mortality at neck, but will increase retinopathy. But this is, happens without increasing blindness. But it is important that we identify these infants who have retin treat retinopathy and treat them appropriately. Yeah. So targeting an intermediate oxygen saturation such as 87 to 93 is an untested practice that may increase mortality, especially when we analyze, as I did, uh, the data by achieved saturations, which indicate that saturations achieved in the, uh, in the optimal group, the 91, 95, were actually in that range, but saturations achieved in the low saturation target group were higher than targeted. So we need new trials for infants above 28 weeks. Uh, especially we also did in term babies. Uh, however, the incidence of ROP in these infants is much less, although I think it's still an important issue to address. So I have to conclude that uh, adopting a saturation target of 91, 95 for infants uh, less than 28 weeks is uh, recommended, and this is supported by high evidence. So there is conclusive evidence that low oxygen saturations achieved, uh, that the infants in the low sat oxygen saturation group achieved oxygen saturation similar to what was done previously of 91, or 85, 95, and targeting Higher oxygen saturations is likely to result in decreased death at neck without increasing adverse outcomes. Uh, so until new data are available, targeting oxygen saturation 91, 95 is probably the best. I should mention that uh, there are some uh, authors that have commented of whether this is, it, this, these targets have, have to be changed after birth or with increasing postnatal age. There's no such evidence. There's no evidence to indicate that they have to be changed depending on fetal hemoglobin. Uh, so I, I should say that that would be further research needed for that. So uh, just to highlight what uh, can be done, and uh, histogram analysis is a way to do it. Uh, this graph shows, this histogram shows uh, targeting in a baby, and it shows how we try to target with keeping the highest columns here between 90 and 95, as you can see here. Uh, there are new ways to uh, monitor uh, and target saturations. Uh, this is the servo control system, one of several available. And it shows that the, during the automated period, the four hours during the automated period, saturations achieved were uh, closer to the targets in this case. Uh, and you can see the many changes in FIO2 that were done during that time compared to the manual period. So there's a program called Oxygen with Love as some of these ideas. Uh, we need nurses that are able to be adjusting the monitors all the time. This is a big challenge. I want to thank uh, my collaborators here uh, and highlight some of our sexoplets in the bottom, our quadruplets there. We've had quintuplets also, multiples. Uh, but I like to highlight that uh, we, uh, we follow these babies, we have parties for them to return. And you can see here in the old films uh, with none of the babies had blindness. We're worried about retinopathy leading to blindness, but it is not that common if we do saturation targeting appropriately as was done in the support trials. Uh, so, Thank you very much for the privilege of 
being here today and sharing some ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. That was an amazing lecture. We would straight away go on to the question answer session. I had great pleasure in introducing two friends of mine, Dr. Tejo Pradap Oleti and Dr. Pinagi Chakravarti to moderate the question answer session. May I also request the uh, uh, respected uh, attendees to kindly post your questions in the Q&A box and not in the chat box. Over to you, the moderators. Thank you. Yeah, it's a really wonderful, uh, Professor Valley, that listening to this. Uh, before uh, Dr. Tejo takes up the few questions, so one question from my side, whether the pulse oximeter that was used was any Mesimo specific or it was the oxygen sets, it was a specific one for each and every institute because it was uh, totally based on this instrument. That's an excellent question. It was uh, the Massimo, yeah. It, it was the most current model at the time. And they it was used in all the sites. All the sites had to use the same monitors, but also with the same masking algorithm. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah, Dr. Tejo. Uh, I think there are quite a number of questions in the question and answer uh, box right now. Uh, so first question from Dr. Bharat was actually, uh, in the initial slides, you have projected that the, what is the incidence of PDA in the low oxygen saturation targets and high oxygen targets. So oxygen being a, uh, will increase the pulmonary blood flow. So might help in the PDA closure. That was the his hypothesis. Why did you felt it is surprised when you saw the PDAs were in a similar manner in the both the groups? Of course, in the meta-analysis, surgical ligation was a little on the higher side. Yeah, that's that's a very good question. Uh, you know, when uh, uh, sometimes we use low levels of evidence to make some clinical assumptions, and that's an example where the evidence for uh, oxygen saturation targets being uh, low, being a risk for PDA, that was really from low levels of evidence. So. Uh, it is true that uh, oxygen uh, will affect the, the ductal closure, uh, but that was not been that had not been tested in randomized control trials. So uh, this evidence is good. It's unclear why uh, we did not find a difference, but there's a slight signal there that may be important in the surgical. Uh, ligation need. Uh, I should say that because the study was totally masked uh, until all the outcomes were obtained, uh, that is a, a signal that can be considered important, but also at the same time, be careful because it's a small signal. Uh, it's only a 1% difference. Uh, plus also it's one of many secondary outcomes analyzed. Thank you, Dr. Professor Wally. Uh, second one was actually about the recommendations. I think in the last slide, sir has already shown the recommendations, what is the better. Yeah. Third thing is that uh, one more question on the oxygen saturation targets. So when there is an established ROP already, do we need to still follow the same 91 to 95% saturation targets or can we allow it to go a little on the higher or lower side, whatever? Yeah, so this was addressed in the R, in the stop rub study. Uh, they they tried. There was a slight benefit of targeting higher saturations, but at the risk of having more pulmonary problems. So I think this is still a practice that is a bit questionable. I would say it varies in the U.S. There's a few centers that use it. Uh, it's not anywhere uh, near uh, uh, the standard of care. Furthermore, in the trials, in the five trials, saturation targeting was not changed once the infants got to severe ROP. Uh, 
So I should say that the good outcomes from blindness and other ophthalmologic findings uh, were independent of changing saturation targets. So the saturation targets were kept the same even when the infants developed severe ROP. Thank you, Professor Ali. The other question was that uh, though the ROP and oxygen are interrelated, uh, could it have been influenced by a little on the, uh, due to incidence of severe gram negative sepsis or fungal infection? Because um, in the low resource setting, the infection is the major cause for many of these ROPs. I, I agree. I think uh, one has to be careful when extrapolating results uh, to settings that outcomes may differ. Uh, I, I should say that nosocomal infection is also quite common in high resource settings. In many centers, like uh, in the high in high resource settings, they also have very small infants that are instrumented and have a lot of late onset sepsis. So I think these results are also independent of the late onset sepsis, but I cannot uh, rule out the possibility that in a setting that infections are much higher, that there would be a difference in outcomes. Uh, do you recommend it uh, to be targeted the saturation with the preductal or postductal? Any difference in the first few days we need to look at it because? That's an interesting question. The, and I think that's an unresolved issue, uh, but, uh, I think we have learned in the last years that pre and postdoctoral saturations may differ uh, in babies. I should say that in the support trial and the other trials, they monitor postnatal saturations outside of the delivery room. Pre doctor saturations were allowed in the delivery room, but once they got outside, they switched to postdoctoral saturations. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Yeah. Want, yeah. yeah. Uh, so next question, uh, Deb, uh, Padma Priya, that how often does the fluctuations in oxygen saturation affect the primary outcome? And how often would the blood cases done once the baby was off CPAP support but needed some oxygen to maintain the target saturation? Okay. So that, that's that a real... That, that's a really good question because it's very pertinent to emphasize how this monitoring was done. So the, the, most of the monitoring for the trial was based on oxygen saturations and they were measured continuously as long as the baby was on oxygen supplementation. So, uh, and then the data were transmitted in such a way that we pick you, we use data from 24 hour recordings every 10 seconds. So it, it's really good data. It's a huge amount of data as you can imagine, uh, but they were all included in the analysis. So uh, we're pretty confident that the oxygen saturation data are very reliable. Yeah. About the blood gases, sir. What the blood gases done once the baby was off CPAP? Yes, blood gases were obtained for the first 14 days. Uh, if the patients were on ventilators, they were required every six hours. And if they were off the ventilator, they were just recorded if available. So blood gases were also obtained. Uh, Okay, thank you, sir. So uh, next question is when we place the pulse oximeter, the saturation that we must measure is pre-ductal or post-ductal? It has already been answered, taken up. I think that has been specifically post-ductal saturation, sir, has already cleared up. What should be the oxygen target for more than 28 weeks gestational weeks of newborn? I think that was not the purview of this study. It was uh, specifically designed for extremely preterm babies below 28 weeks. Uh, uh, sir, your comment, if, uh, if you want to comment, though it was not within the support style, please. Above 28 gestational weeks newborn. 
Yeah, I, I think that gets uh, complicated to extrapolate uh, data from patients below 28 weeks. Uh, I, I should say that uh, when the patients were more uh, than 28 weeks, obviously they were, that was at birth, but the targeting persisted throughout uh, at up to 36 weeks. So uh, while we don't have really data on babies that started at uh, 28 weeks and beyond, we have babies with corrected postnatal age between 28 weeks, uh, uh, but they were targeted the same way. And we don't know if that, yeah. you know, fr from the beginning would make a difference uh, in these infants. So we, uh, in general, the investigators have agreed that they don't think we should recommend targets on the more mature infants just because we studied more mature, more immature infants. Yeah, so thank you, sir. That is no extrapolated, but we would be going with this uh, magic figure, sir, has given with 91 to 95, probably. And uh, another question from Mexico. One question, what was your experience about the patient less than 28 week uh, that we can extubate early and continue <laughs> with ventilation? It's difficult to prevent the damage of the oxygen. What do you recommend? Okay, that's a good, very good question, okay? Indeed, as you all recall, the support trial was a factorial trial, and uh, the other intervention was uh, trying to use permissive percapnia and CPAP instead of mechanical ventilation, and uh, a difference was achieved, so it was successful, that part also. Uh, and the effort of, the, there was no adverse effects of trying to get the patients off ventilator into non-invasive ventilation, such as CPAP or other methods on the oxygen saturation targeting. So uh, there was uh, no e interaction between the two interventions, meaning that we can try to extubate a baby aggressively and still try to aim for the saturation targets. So, so I, and I think that's, that was really good that the support trial had both intervention. I should mention that the other four trials did not have a, a similar design, so they cannot inform that practice, uh, but in general, uh, especially these days that uh, the, met the other meta-analysis has shown that CPAP and permissive apricamnia are beneficial uh, compared to uh, keeping the patients on a ventilator. Uh, I, I think one should acknowledge that uh, the oxygen saturation targets can be continued even with aggressive extubation. So if, yes. if there was an implication that we cannot keep saturation targets uh, while off the ventilator, I should say most of the time in the support trial that patients were on oxygen were off mechanical ventilation. So yeah, that, that was, the targeting was very effective also while on non-invasive ventilation. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Sunil Pawar. Uh, it was on the intermittent hypoxia. In intermittent hypoxia, when the child has it, does the fall in saturation is more important, more uh, uh, have the effect on the outcome, or duration of hypoxia plays an important role, as you have shown in the histogram also, how the saturations will be there. Yeah, yeah that's that's a really good question. We. Uh, are very interested in studying intermittent hypoxia or hypoxemia. Uh, and for those that may not be using that term commonly, uh, that has been used for saturations intermittently below 90 or below 80%. Uh, and there are several studies of showing associations of intermittent hypoxemia and adverse outcomes. But those are associations we don't know yet from randomized trials uh, 
if those intermittent hypoxemia episodes are so clinically important, it's likely that the data that have been reported are biased because the sicker babies will have more intermittent hypoxemia. However, uh, uh, I, I should say that the support trial has been, data have been studied. There's a few issues with intermittent hypoxemia. They tend to increase the first few weeks, five or six weeks after birth, and then they gradually decrease on the, in this patient population. There are some studies that have been done in terms of uh, predicting outcome. Uh, and uh, these are association studies, but they indicate an association between these episodes and adverse outcomes, such as BPD, for example. But it would be expected that you as a clinician, as clinicians would expect babies that continue to have desaturations uh, despite being on oxygen are going to be at high risk of adverse outcomes. And that's what the studies show. Uh, is there any data on uh, pulmonary artery hypertension or PPH in these two groups? And this was by Dr. Manu Sharma. That's it. That's a great question. We have been actively looking at this, okay? So I'll tell you all, everything we've done so you, you all understand. Uh, we're very interested because we're worried that the low saturation targeted would, could have led to pulmonary hypertension, but the evidence is not there yet. So first, uh, when looking at the causes of death, there was no difference in pulmonary hypertension. There was no difference in the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension, although I should say that that was not something that the investigators were so interested in, in, in assessing because at the time, in the year 2005, when the study was started, a pulmonary hypertension in preterm babies was not highly uh, recognized. Uh, our first studies were around 2010 that we started to report uh, pulmonary hypertension in these premature babies. Uh, uh, we have ongoing studies trying to assess this. There were echocardiograms performed during that time in the support trial, and we're looking at these studies to see if we can uh, determine if they were developing pulmonary hypertension. I should say that, uh, as you all know, uh, pulmonary hypertension is being more commonly reported in extremely preterm infants with BPD. Uh, yes. But, but we don't know if it's due to the targeting. I should say that we now target saturations of 91, 95, and we still have survivors that, uh, with BPD that develop pulmonary hypertension. So it's not going to be a magic bullet that using 91, 95 will eliminate. I think we're having more and more survivors of extreme prematurity, and therefore we will uh, keep diagnosing more with uh, pulmonary hypertension. Oh, thank you, thank you, sir. This was really uh, enlightening for us. So to end up from uh, this question, uh, last is by uh, Dr. Habib. What is your opinion about using endotracheal tube as nasopharyngeal tube for NIV for babies less than 28 weeks to go away from intubation and side effects? To using ETT as nasopharyngeal tube as for those NIV for these babies? Yes, uh, I, I think that's a good way to administer, say, CPAP or maybe a, a nasal IMV. A, a IMV. Uh, so the, the evidence is that even from back old days, uh, many years ago, uh, and, uh, a, and a nasal tube or an oral tube was placed in the pharynx and to support, the to provide CPAP. So that's been, a, a practice proven before. Uh, I should say that now uh, when we extubate very small babies, sometimes 
uh, we have to resort to uh, a, a tube, an oral tube, because uh, the CIPA prongs, the nasal prongs are too large for the very small babies. So we have used a, 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 a short a, a endotracheal tube, but into the pharynx only, not into the trachea. And these days, I think in general, the, maybe the major comment is that there are many alternatives to mechanical ventilation. CPAP is a traditional one, but there more and more, there's other studies showing non-inferiority of less invasive modes such as uh, a high flow nasal cannula or other modifications. So I think uh, there has been, uh, uh, there's a substantial amount of evidence that indicates that there are alternatives that can be used. Yeah, thank you, thank you, sir. So this uh, probably answers the questions uh, from the US session. So Monosa, any questions from the in the YouTube? Uh, yeah, I think that is it. That has been already posted. Yeah. Already. So before I think we can close, I will put one or two from my queries. Uh, uh, Dr. Carlos, you had told that the SGA subgroup analysis was done. So now uh, there are more and more neonates who are getting born at the extreme preterm gestation, along with the Doppler abnormality and fetal growth restriction. So can we extrapolate the results which are there from this neoprom analysis to this group of neonates because a lot of epigenetics and other things have been taught about this FGR and uh, because these are the babies who are different from the babies who have a good blood flow in the uterus. Yeah. Yes. So in, in general, yeah, that's that's a high risk group, but I would say that the adverse outcomes are not dependent on the, are not different, let's say, are not different uh, to those of bigger babies uh, by saturation targets. So the specific issue, as you mentioned, uh, there was concern from the support data that the small for gestational uh, age infants were the ones at highest risk of death uh, with the, in the low saturation target group. But, uh, that was actually one definition of SGA. If you look at more continuous outcome uh, or of percentile of birth weight, or if you use other definitions of SGA, and especially when you add all the data from the Neoprom, one can see that uh, there's no difference in outcomes. Uh, sorry, that, that, that the SGA babies did not respond any differently to the low saturation targets. So what the study with by Michelle Walsh uh, suggested was that the AGA babies did not have the same effect, uh, uh, did not have the higher mortality. Uh, so it was only limited to SGA infants. That was not the case in the Neoprom or uh, including adding the, the support data to the Neoprom. So including all the data, there was no difference in uh, the results, S meaning that the AGA babies are also at risk the same way that SGA babies are at risk for low oxygen saturation targets, so are the AGA babies. Uh, I, I, I would say that this, SGA babies, and you mentioned uh, uterine blood flow, are at especially high risk. Yes, there are other high risk that they have. They have maybe at higher risk of necrotizing enterocolitis, at higher risk of death in general, but not dependent on the oxygen saturation target. Sure, thank you. And uh, one more is that with the newer interventions, universal coverage, something like a prophylactic caffeine nowadays, Everyone is using for all the babies who are less than 28 weeks. So like these newer and newer uh, interventions which are coming, uh, do you think that still that oxygen tar saturation targets 
will have a major role in determining the death bpd and rop or these can modify a little uh, the final outcomes so that's a good question that you're posing uh, because caffeine for example is now used early and in the past it was used a little bit later yeah. uh, uh, I should say that um, while uh, we cannot answer that question specifically, uh, it is unlikely that caffeine administration will affect the uh, relationship substantially. Some patients had always been started on caffeine early. Let's say the ones that were not so sick may have been uh, they, if they were going to be extubated, they were given caffeine uh, early. Uh, but the difference is now it may be used in babies who are going to be on a ventilator for a longer time, uh, which is also not a proven practice. Uh, so I, 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 I would say that an unproven practice like early caffeine cannot be used to truncate the evidence from a randomized control trial or meta-analysis like this. I fully agree with you. Yeah, so we should not uh, say that we are using all these things and we can target any situation. <laughs> I fully agree with you. And even if anyone is using any free radical scavenger also, it doesn't mean that you have to target yeah. the saturations a little higher side or something. Yeah. That's right. Yes? Yeah. Hey, Dr. Manoj, any other queries? Yeah. I think we have uh, uh, come to the end of the questions and then it was an amazing session um, uh, as usual uh, um, uh, whenever we hear Professor Valley, you know like he's uh, he covers the topic so extensively that uh, it's, uh, really would like to hear more and more from you sir in the future <laughs> now I I have the uh, pleasant task of uh, proposing a water thanks so uh, first of all, I'd like to thank both the uh, organize and uh, moderators, uh, Dr. Tejo and Dr. Pinaki, uh, for beautifully handling the questions and then moderating the session so nicely. And uh, uh, I would really again and again like to thank Professor Valaman Carlo. Uh, Professor Valley, your session was excellent, and then it is raising the st academic standards for the sessions that we have. And we really look forward to having you in person in the subsequent congresses that we or organize. Thank you so much, sir. Thank and you very much for this kind invitation and organizing such a big conference. So thank you. My privilege to be here with you today. Thank you, sir. Thank and you, sir. We are pleased. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And before thank we you, go, uh, thank you, Pinaki. Thank you, Tejo. Before we close, uh, I would uh, uh, be failing in my duty if I do not thank the um, uh, attendees, the respected attendees, we have we have a large number of uh, attendees who are attending the session now, right now in this and the subsequent time zones in the next uh, hours to come. So it is so nice of you to join us, uh, and uh, we continue the series. Now there are two unconfirmed lectures, uh, the, uh, as the dates are not confirmed. The confirmed lecture, as of now, we go on to discuss the limits of viability for extreme preterm infants of course the sender of uh, obviously this is um, something from iowa so we have professor edward bell from iowa who would be talking to us about what are the limits of viability for extremely primitive infants the, the this lecture is scheduled on 20th october thursday at the same um, okay we come back to our usual day thursday this session had to be on a wednesday but otherwise it's thursdays at 7 30 pm and uh, before that, if we have any session, then we will be letting you. So on that note, uh, we would end today. Uh, thank you so much once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good day. meeting you. Good day, yeah. Professor Valley. Good day. Good day. Good, day. good night to each and everyone. Have a nice day, Professor. Yeah. Nice. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.